Well, hello, and welcome to our online service for May 17th, 2020. I know that these are difficult days and it's hard for us to not be able to gather in the same place that we're used to gathering, but at the same time, I'm very thankful for the privilege that we have of being able to gather online in opportunities such as this to, uh, to study the Word together and to uh, be encouraged by what God is doing in our midst. A couple of announcements as we get started this morning. First of all, all on-site services are canceled until further notice. I recognize that there are people on both sides of the issue of are we opening too soon or are we uh, waiting, should we wait longer? And we're going to take a very, uh, very cautious approach as a church. We have a lot of things that we want to make sure of. We want to make sure that we're safe as we uh, approach this reopening. So the church board has appointed a reopening team that will be processing those details and we'll let you know when we determine to open, uh, but it won't be in the immediate future. So uh, until then, we will continue to meet online. Facebook Live, 1030 on uh, Sunday mornings, or Facebook Video, <laughs> 1030 Sunday mornings. We'll also post the video on YouTube and on the church app. And it goes live shortly before 1030. And it's exciting to be able to, to watch those together. Uh, we'll do a watch party at 1030 on Facebook. We also meet on Facebook Live at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evenings. And uh, we're continuing in uh, a similar strain of, of thought. We're, we're working our way through 2 Corinthians between Wednesdays and Sundays. And so if you would like to uh, join us for that, uh, we would love to have you uh, as we work our way through uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. For those of you who are able to give during this time, uh, we certainly do appreciate that. Uh, online giving is available on our church website uh, by clicking on the Donate tab. You can also give through the church app, or you can give by texting the word GIVE with an amount to the number 563-334-0110. And that's an acceptable and appreciated way to give as well. Um, we realize that many of you are facing financial difficulties and we want to put no pressure on you whatsoever during this time. But for many others, you're able to give and your continued um, contributions are greatly helpful for us as a church during this time. Also want to remind you that I do spend time every day praying for you. And if you've got a specific request, please feel free to uh, submit that request either through the church app or via email or via text. Uh, happy to pray with you as you uh, work through the challenges that you face. Uh, and I do spend time praying for each one of you each day. All of our previous services and sermons can be watched on our website under the video sermon tab. Um, if you would like to, uh, to watch previous services, and then we will uh, follow this sermon this morning with a time of pre-recorded music uh, from a previous service that we've had. Well, with that, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your love for us and for the privilege that we have of gathering in this place online today. God, I realize that, uh, that we're gathered in living rooms and kitchens and dining rooms and offices and all over the Quad Cities and even around the country. And as we gather, as we focus our attention on you, I pray that you would meet with us. I pray that during this time that you would help us with the distractions, that we would be able to focus our attention on you, to stay focused in and not be thinking about what else might be on Facebook this morning, but to truly stay tuned to what you're doing and what you're saying to us. And Father, I pray that you would encourage us as we go through this time. For those who are going through um, this, uh, this time on the front lines and those who are serving in retail and in medical situations and um, in distribution and, and for restaurants that are opening back up, for those who are serving on the front lines, I pray for your hand of protection. And Father, for those who are um, staying at home and trying their best to, to support the help, those who are working by staying home, I pray that you would help us in our times of stir craziness to be reminded of your love for us and that you are with us. Give us opportunities to reach out through phone calls and texts uh, to connect with those around us, even though we may not be able to be face to face. And Father, I pray that you would continue to teach us the lessons in this time that you know we need to hear. We don't slow down very often as a culture. We don't listen very well as a culture. But during this time that we have slowed down, during this time that we have uh, stopped many of our activities, I pray that you would speak to us and help us to continue to 
to learn the lessons and to apply them so that when we start to return to the new normal, that it will look different, that we will not just go about things the same way, but that we will apply the lessons that you have been teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, uh, this morning we're going to continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, a conversation that we started on Wednesday night, looking at a new thing that God is doing. Now, the book of 2 Corinthians is a, a letter that is written after a long conflict that Paul has had with the church in Corinth. He's also, during this time, been going through a, a horrific event in Ephesus where he's writing from, but the combination of these two has made this a really challenging time for Paul, which is why I chose to, to work through this passage or this book during this time because I realized that Paul is facing a lot of the same emotions and frustrations that we're feeling right now. He is heading to Corinth as he writes this letter seemingly as he writes. So it's, it's like he writes a little bit here and, and then the next time that he writes, it seems like he's a little bit further down the road. Um, so it seems like he's writing this letter as he's journeying to Corinth. He's already addressed some of the conflict and there are still a lot of areas of conflict that he'll address as we continue through this letter. But he stops in the middle and he starts to remind them of their faith. There are things that, that we need to be reminded of frequently because it's the reason that we fight about things and it's the resolution to our fighting about things. Our faith is the reason that we wrestle through life. If we, weren't, if we didn't have faith, we wouldn't have to wrestle. We would just do whatever we wanted to do. If we didn't have faith, just let everybody else do what they want to do. But because we have faith, we want to make sure that we're we're wrestling through what needs to be tackled because things matter because of our faith. So Paul reminds them of their faith because it is, is what they fought about as they were fighting in their conflict. And the truth is that they had something worth fighting for, as do we today. So if you have your Bibles, let's, uh, let's open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read a bit this morning from verse 4 to 18, uh, but follow along with me as we go. We are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. He has enabled us to be ministered of, ministers of His new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant the Spirit gives life. The old way, with laws etched in stone, led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though all the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so that they cannot understand the truth, and this veil can only be removed by believing in Christ. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil, and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom." So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Well, this is a, an interesting passage. It's one that, uh, uh, that reminds us of, of when we're trying to convince someone of something because Paul is clearly trying to lay it on thick to convince the Corinthian church of this new way that he's, uh, he's reminding them of. But in order for there to be a new way, there had to be an old way. And there, the old way 
was once the new way. It's important that we start there as we begin our time in this passage because we have to realize there's a reason that people cling to the old ways because they were once the new ways. And the old ways were once revolutionary. Although they may not be revolutionary anymore, at one time they were. The Model T, for example, was once an amazing invention that allowed the everyday American to own an automobile, to be able to, to change the way that we lived because no longer were you stuck at home, you could get in your car and go to town in considerably faster than you could have by horseback or by walking. The Model T was revolutionary, but there are many things about the Model T that when we look at it today, we think it couldn't even survive today. The truth is that the Model T's top speed was 45 miles an hour, which in case you're wondering is not even legal to be on the interstate today because that's the minimum speed. The, the Model T came in whatever color you wanted as long as you wanted black. Henry Ford was famous for making that statement and he was angry with anybody who wanted to change anything about the Model T. It was once amazing, but as we look at it now, it looks rather ancient and we try to figure out how would you operate that thing. But Bob and Steve could probably tell us how. They, they remember they were there when it was revolutionary. The old way that Paul is talking about with the people in Corinth refers to specifically the old way of Jewish faith. But in the audience, in those who were listening to Paul's letter, some of them had cast away pagan faiths. The pagan faiths were um, the, the Roman system of religion, which really focused on a multitude of gods and keeping them from being angry. So all of the sacrifices, all of the offerings that people would take to the gods were really efforts to keep them from being angry with them. The Romans loved to be ignored by their gods. They hated to be singled out by their gods. And whenever calamity faced them, or whenever they faced difficult times, they felt they must have angered the gods in order for this to happen. So whenever plagues would hit, they would think someone has angered the gods. That's why we're being, being exposed to this. Now, I realize that uh, today, COVID has, has really changed life for us. And I've heard a lot of crazy stuff on Facebook and on the internet. I don't think I've heard anybody saying who angered the gods. Maybe they have and I just haven't seen it. But that's not the way that we think now. But in that day, that's exactly what people would be thinking. Who has angered the gods so that we're facing this type of, of plague? So all of their religious activities centered on keeping the gods appeased. But many of the audience had moved from Judaism into Christianity. Now, Christianity is not a different religion than Judaism. Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism, and Paul certainly re recognized that and, and approached it that way. And that's why he went to the Jew first to, to present in the synagogues the truth of, of Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. It's what they had been waiting for, and now Paul was telling them that it was here. But as they came from Judaism into Christianity, it was easy for them to, to cling to what they used to do. It was easy for them to cling to the old ways. Now, the pagans tried to keep the gods pacified, and the Jews really tried to keep themselves clean. But it was there was a sense in the in the laws of the Jewish people that you could never measure up, you were always lacking in some way, and it was just a matter of time before you were found out. And the Jewish system exposed what was wrong, but it offered no cure. And so Paul was telling them, you got to focus on the new way, the new way where there is a cure, and that cure is Jesus Christ. Now, as we read through this passage, it's clear to see that Paul is a salesman. He clearly believes in his product. He's done his homework on both the old and the new, and he's convinced that the new way is better. 
it kind of reminds me of whenever I'm trying to convince Janelle that I need some new gadget. The new cell, cell phone or computer or whatever it may be. I'll go through the list of the old one would do it this way, but the new one does it this way. And the old one would do this, but the new one does this. And Janelle usually gets pretty sick of my efforts. She can see what I'm doing. And she said, just get what you want to get. You don't have to convince me. But I feel like I do. I have to convince somebody to convince myself because I typically talk out loud. But it's like Paul is, is presenting in a sales convention. I mean, you hear that as he's, as he's saying what he's saying here. If the old way was glorious, then the new way is so much more glorious. If the old way was better, then the new way is so much better. If the old way had 4G, the new way has 5G internet. He doesn't say that, but that's what we would say today. The old way had this kind of a cell phone, but the new one has this cell phone. This is the new technology that makes everything faster, everything better. Paul is, sales, is so educated about this in part because he had been a salesman for the old product. His life before being a Christian was he was a Pharisee and he was the salesman of the old law. He was the one who tried to convince people to follow the laws of God and to hold them accountable when they couldn't. He had become convinced of the, new, the benefits of the new product through a series of, of events where God spoke to him specifically, personally, audibly. But then through the, the experience that he had with Jesus, time that he spent in the desert, time that he spent in the wilderness, time he spent at home, and time he spent with other Christians. He became convinced of the truth of the new product. And so he set aside the old and was selling the new. So he quickly summarizes the main benefits of the new way in this, uh, in this section of Scripture. It's clearly better. The old way led to death, but the new way leads to life. It's not the life and death way that we're talking about a lot in the news today. But it is eternal death or eternal life that Paul is talking about here. There's an interesting quote that, uh, that I came across in my reading this, way and this week, and I've already kind of alluded to it. But Frank Carver says this. He says, John Calvin comments that Paul considered the function of the law in Israel's history to be to show us the disease without offering any hope of cure. By way of contrast, the function of the gospel was to provide a remedy for those in despair. I think we can relate to this quote powerfully today. I don't know how many of you watch the news. I intentionally don't try to watch the news. It really doesn't matter if it's going to rain or not these days because I don't have anything planned and I'm not going anywhere. Um, but I do read the news uh, frequently because I do want to know I just don't have the patience to listen to somebody else telling me I can skim read and get what I need a little bit quicker that way. But everything that I read is telling me all about the disease that we're facing in our culture. And everything that I read is telling us all of the, the intricacies of it, but nothing is known yet of a cure. They've tried this and this has worked some places and, and that's worked some places, but it didn't work here or it didn't work there. Unfortunately, we're seeing an awful lot about a disease that has no cure. That's what sin has been to the, the, the Jewish people up to this point. They knew the disease. They knew the effects of sin. They knew the impacts of sin. But they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know how to get through it or what the answer was. But in Jesus Christ, Paul is telling the people there is a cure, and His name is Jesus. That's a powerful concept. Very applicable to us today in 2020. But Paul continues talking about the new way. And he's got a couple of things when he talks about the new way that, that really jumped out at me. One is that the new way gives life. He actually said that twice in what he was saying. The new way makes us right with God. 
The old way pointed out how we were wrong with God, but the new way makes us right with God. By, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we can be made right. We can be forgiven for our sins instead of just being told that we have sins. So the new way gives life. The new way makes us right with God. The new way remains forever. When, when we think of that in terms of, of Scripture, it's hard for us to kind of capture what he's saying. But what Paul is saying here is that there isn't going to be another way coming. This is the way forever. For all eternity, the new way which makes us right which gives us life, remains forever. Paul also said this, that it gives us confidence. Now Paul is clear throughout this letter that confidence is not something that they have in their own abilities or in their own selves. It's what they have as a result of God working in them. The new way gives us the confidence to follow God because His Spirit is giving us what we need in the moment. Now, our culture celebrates new. We're constantly being told that we need the newest item. These new items, though, are soon outdated. But we're told to keep buying the newest. We deal with this with technology is where I tend to spend the most money on this kind of thing. I've, I've got to have this new gadget or, or this new thing. Because this one doesn't do it. My old one doesn't do it. We're infatuated with the new. Truthfully, in our culture, we can find ourselves addicted to the new. Addicted to the adrenaline rush of getting the new, but then we become frustrated when the new becomes old. I, I love having a new cell phone until the next model comes out. And then all of a sudden, even though mine still does today what it did yesterday, it feels inadequate. Because it's not the newest. It still functions in a way that, that yesterday made me happy, but to, because today there's a new one, I feel dissatisfied with it. Our culture teaches us that. Billions of dollars are spent every year to tell us that you've got to have the newest or you're not good enough. Now, this is not the kind of new that Paul is talking about. Paul is not trying to, to sell us a product that is going to only last for a short time. Paul is trying to sell us the news that will last through all eternity. The good news that Jesus Christ is the answer to the problems that we face. Not in a cliche way. Not in a, oh, just pray and it'll all be better but in a way that says Jesus understands what you're facing. In a way that says Jesus wants to work in and through His people to make all things new and all things right. In a way that says Jesus understands the heartbreak that we're facing right now as a nation and as a world. And Jesus wants to be with us in the midst of that heartbreak. To, to be reminded of the good and to be working in a way that we look and we say, wow, that was a God thing. God didn't cause COVID, but Jesus is at work in the midst of COVID to bring hope to all of us, to bring answers that we need, but to bring hope in the midst of the suffering. Paul here is talking about that new way of life, a way of living that goes beyond just cliches, a way of living that goes beyond just following rules, but a way of living that, that enters into a relationship with the living God, a, a new way that, that promises freedom and delivers it. It promises freedom from the, the oppression that we've had and it delivers that freedom in a way that, that changes us from the inside out. It truly brings freedom into our lives. Problem is that we have to keep our eyes on the new way, but the old way keeps calling. 
We make the commitment to follow after Jesus, but the old way keeps calling. And quite honestly, we tend to feel more comfortable in the old ways. We tend to feel more comfortable in ways where, where we're just complaining and angry with the world rather than being comfortable in the new way. It takes a while for us to adjust to the new way that God is, is bringing about in us. So perhaps today, some of you need to choose this new way of life. Perhaps today some of you have, have been coming to church for a while, but you've never said, you know, I really want to make that decision to follow Jesus. I really want to step into that new way that doesn't just say you're messed up, but that says, here's the answer for your mess. And it's a very simple process if you want to choose this new way to pray and ask God to forgive you for your sins and to walk in relationship with you. If you make that decision today, shoot me a message, let me know, and I'd be happy to support you and help you understand what this means and what next steps are as we follow Jesus. But perhaps today you've been walking in the way of Jesus, but the old way has been calling too, and you need to be reminded that you're a part of the new way. You need to be reminded that, that you don't want to live in the negativity that you used to live in. You don't want to engage in the sins that have held you in bondage any longer. You've made that commitment to follow Jesus, but you've fallen back into the, the traps. And maybe you've been doing your very best to follow the new way, but you just feel discouraged this morning. And you just need to be reminded that this isn't going to last forever. The new way is going to see us through. What God offers to us will see us through the challenges that we're facing today. Paul was coming out of the most difficult time in his life as he writes this letter. But he was walking into the most productive time in his life. It's interesting, as I've studied the, the life of Paul and, and with help from great scholars like N.T. Wright, I've realized the timing of where Paul writes this letter and the immaturity that we see in Paul looking back, but the great depth that we see from this point in Paul's life forward. What Paul wrote from this point forward has literally changed the world. The book of Romans, which he's going to write after he writes this book, is going to change the world. It was the, the impetus for Martin Luther bringing about the Protestant Reformation. It was the impetus for John Wesley becoming saved and realizing that, that we can know that we're forgiven for our sins and we don't have to live in bondage to sin any longer. The work of Paul after this point in his life is the most productive. And these two are clearly connected. Paul could not have been as productive in the second half of his life if he had not had this difficult experience in Ephesus and with the church in Corinth. Now for those of you who watched on Wednesday, we started to talk about this and I, I ask you to think about a question. What new might God want to do during, in you during this time? So I want us to think about that question a little bit this morning in light of Paul's journey. The truth is that this has been an extremely difficult time for all of us. For those who are serving on the front lines, for those who are staying home, our lives changed in an instant. And everything that we were used to doing, everything that we were comfortable with, changed overnight. And we all find ourselves in a great uncomfortableness there's a there's an anger that we feel with what has happened there's a frustration with what has happened and there's a frustration with what is continuing to happen our lives have changed we're in a time of crisis we're facing a difficult set of circumstances as a community, as a church, as a country, as a world, this is a difficult time. 
But the Bible is full of stories of people who faced hard times and full of the reminder that God never wastes a crisis. That God tends to work in crisis more so than other times because we're open to Him working, because we see our need of Him. And He loves to do something new in people. And He loves to do new things through people. But a lesson that I've had to learn is that God doesn't want to do things through me until think God has done something in me. Now my human nature says, I want to do something, I want God to do something through me first, but God says, no, Emmanuel, before I can use you, I need to change you because who you are is not as good as you think. Who you are is not as important as you think. This has been one of those times where, where I've had to come to God and just say, God, what do you need to change in me during this time? There's still things in my life that I am constantly reminded of that, that God needs to work on me in this. I still get very impatient. I, I can get very angry with situations. I can get very angry with people. There's things that God needs to do in me and God is working and God has worked in me in this time of, of COVID. Books that I've been able to read and, and conversations I've been able to have with Janelle that, that have helped me to bring to light some of these things. But also realizing that, that things are changing in the world that is coming. We're not going to view life the same. And before God can, can do something new through me, before God can do something new through us, God has to do something new in us. And so we need to open ourselves up to God, asking Him this question, what new does God want to do in us? I know these are tough times. I know that none of us ever want to go through this again. And I know that we want this to be over now. But I want us to keep this question in our mind. As we go through this journey, recognizing what God has done through the Apostle Paul, recognizing what God has done through, through countless people in Scripture, when they have faced difficulties, God has worked in their lives in amazing ways. And so the question for us today is what does God want to do in us? Not in spite of this difficult circumstance, but because of this difficult circumstance. What does God want to do in us? Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm praying for you as you go through this time. And when things feel overwhelming, just ask the question, God, what is the new that you want to do in us? Enjoy this time of worship as we continue, and may God bless.
Nothing else. Nothing else.